This is section 33 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Political Speech Republican Rally, Hartford Opera House, October 26, 1880. Read by John Greenman. Friends say to me, What do you mean by this? You swore off from lecturing years ago. Well, that is true. I did reform, and I reformed permanently, too. But this ain't a lecture. It's only a speech, nothing but a mere old cut-and-dried impromptu speech. And there's a great moral difference between a lecture and a speech, I can tell you. For when you deliver a lecture, you get good pay but when you make a speech you don't get a cent you don't get anything at all from your own party and you don't get anything out of the opposition but a noble good supply of infamous episodes in your own private life which you hadn't heard of before a scorching lot of facts about your private rascalities and scoundrelisms which is brand new to you all good enough stuff for by and by when you get ready to write your autobiography but of no immediate use to you further than to show you what you could have become if you had attended strictly to business i have never made but one political speech before this that was years ago i made a logical closely reasoned compact powerful argument against a discriminating and iniquitous tax which was about to be imposed by the opposition i may say i made a most thoughtful symmetrical and admirable argument but a michigan newspaper editor answered it refuted it utterly demolished it by saying i was in the constant habit of horsewhipping my great-grandmother i should not have minded it so much well i don't know that i should have minded it at all a little thing like that if he had said i did it for her good but when he said i merely did it for exercise i felt that such a statement as that was almost sure to cast a shadow over my character however i don't mind these things particularly it is the only intelligent and patriotic way of conducting a campaign i don't mind what the opposition say of me so long as they don't tell the truth about me but when they descend to telling the truth about me i consider that that is taking an unfair advantage why should we be bitter against each other such of us of both parties as are not ashamed of being americans but perhaps i have said enough by way of preface i am going to vote the republican ticket myself from old habit but what i am here for is to try to persuade you to vote the democratic ticket because if you throw the government of this country into the hands of the republicans they will unquestionably kill that wood tariff project but if you throw this government into the hands of the democrats the wood tariff project will become the law of the land and every one of us will reap his share of the enormous benefits resulting from it there will be nothing sectional about it its wholesome generosities are as all-embracing as the broad and general atmosphere the north the south the east the west will all have their portion of those benefactions consider the south share for instance with a tariff for 
revenue only and no tariff for protection she will not be obliged to carry on a trade with us of the north and pay northern prices no she can buy of england duty free at far cheaper rates the price of her cotton will remain as before but the cost of producing will be vastly diminished and the profit vastly increased wealth will pour in on her in such a deluge that she will not know what to do with the money in time she will be able to buy and sell the north will the south cast a solid vote for the wood tariff bill i am glad to believe yes to know that the south will stand by our senator eaton to a man in this great and good cause and think of our share in the benefits of the wood tariff some of our people sit up and cry all night for joy when they think of them they've raised the rivers here with their tears joyful tears and dissipated the malaria and i wish they'd keep on crying it is the only efficient sewerage we've ever had our first and chiefest benefit from the wood tariff will be that we shan't have any more factory smoke statistics on file in the war department show that more people's eyes are injured by factory smoke in a year than by any other agent statistics i've come loaded with statistics for i've noticed that a man can't prove anything without statistics no man can senator eaton himself can't prove anything without statistics or with them or whichever it is i don't remember which it is now but i know it is one or the other of them for i had it all thought out once statistics statistics why statistics are more precious and useful than any other one thing in this world except whiskey i i, I mean hymn books uh, this comes of trusting to inspiration instead of sticking to the cold text a man can ruin himself that way making a public speech statistics in the navy department show that if the factory smoke were done away with there would be a saving to the north every year of over two hundred thousand dollars in diminished wash bills alone and that the washerwoman who is today able to support her husband and children in free-handed plenty at the tub would have to come down to wages that would not only benefit her health and strength by requiring her to work nights as well as days but would enable you and me to fairly wallow in dissipations which are denied to us now by the grinding tyranny of the weekly wash bill statistics in the interior department show that factory smoke causes more profanity to the square mile than any other known agent except the book agent statistics in the department of justice show that with the departure of factory smoke the factory workmen would depart also of necessity they and their wives and children and get what they need and what their honest hard work has earned for them a good long soul-satisfying holiday nothing in the world to do but lie around in comfort and enjoy themselves and while they were having holidays and a good time the rest of the people would be vastly benefited too for occasionally when you needed a capable man to do some work for you you could get him for half a dollar a day you could have your pick and choice then 
but you can't now for there is more work and money than men so they are in a position to come or not just as they please for a man can be as independent and as much his own master free and untrammeled on enough as he can be on fifty thousand times enough it is only when you cut him below enough that he ceases to be independent and can neither ante nor pass the buck as the prophet says and so of course you raise him and raise him and raise him till you raise him out as the poet says and it's no trick for you to do it because you hold a flush against his two pair and a jack i trust i make myself understood yes you can get men exceeding cheap then in the good time that is coming when the democratic tariff bill goes through and our architecture will improve too for we shall have the stateliest kind of poor houses all around and everywhere they'll be so thick that the worst marksman here couldn't miss them with an old-fashioned allen's revolver and ten per cent of the population will be in them and just as comfortable and contented as angels why you can even save on pew rent then pew rent will go down to next to nothing and the poorest sinner can have a place to sleep and real estate well, think of that you can buy a corner lot then for less than it costs you to buy a grave now of course you'll need the grave more then but never mind that that's a matter of detail you'll take which you please i'm not trying to dictate i'm only using the thing as an illustration and you can build a house then cheaper than you can bury a man today and there's more satisfaction in it too unless you can pick your man you can keep a carriage then for less than it costs you to keep a wheelbarrow now and bigamy think of that bigamy will be cheaper then than monogamy is now there's a million arguments but i've only got all night to talk in so i must leave most of them out the tyrannous unequal values of today will disappear and real estate on the ground and real estate in a cart will be the same price fifteen cents a cubic yard and that is right that is just try to make me believe there's differences in dirt with my familiarity with it that one kind of dirt is worth more than another kind that even the best dirt is worth more than fifteen cents a yard <laughs> no sir i think it's high and in place of the confusion and noise of today and the unsightly mud the streets of the north will slumber in a soothing sabbath calm restful to the weary spirit and be adorned with soft rich carpets of grass a solace to the eye and a satisfaction to the foot the odious law which today deprives us of the improving elevating humanizing society of the tramp will be swept from the statute book by the tramp himself for we shall all be tramps then and can outvote anything that can be devised to hamper us and give the opposition long odds too once more we shall see our old ragged tourists moving in eternal procession from house to house disdaining bread and demanding pie at the butt end of the club immigration will cease the emigration will take its place and we shall all be benefited because we shall pack up and go to countries where we can get 
fifty-five cents a day and feed on meat four times a month and we can stretch forth a helping hand to revered old england in this her time of heavy distress she was our enemy in the war days and did all she could to injure us and cripple us and insult us but she stands ready to be our friend now and it is our duty and should be our pleasure to forgive and forget and meet her with the kiss of love and peace she is ready to be our friend yes more than ready she is eager she is anxious to be our friend and all she asks for this is that we shall pass the wood tariff bill and so give her famishing factories a magnificent new lease of life and her whole people a rousing prosperity such as they have not known for years a prosperity which will amply make up for all she is losing through her land troubles in ireland and by the generous might of the great democratic party we will pass this bill and fall weeping upon the grateful bosom of our old suffering motherland we will say you fitted out pirates against us but we forgive you you cheated us out of one pirate after we had thrashed him in fair fight and had a just and righteous mortgage on him but we forgive you you connived secretly with louis napoleon for our overthrow but we forgive you you feasted and honored and sheltered our enemies and obstructed our friends and sneered at them but we forgive you you have been the irishman's hard master at home for seven hundred years and you will be his hard master now in america but no matter he forgives you and we forgive you all and everything and you shall have your wood tariff bill which you urge upon us with an eloquence which moves even the unsentimental among us to say take our forges take our factories take our prosperities take all we have only say we are the one utterly loving generous forgiving forgetting magnanimous nation that graces the earth yes let her say that to us and remove the troublesome factory smoke and it is all we ask for the one great central idea of this presidential battle is not which is the better man of the two it is not war or peace it is not religion it is not sectional supremacy it is not national honor national glory no it is none of these it is factory smoke it all turns on factory smoke other matters are trifling they are nothing the supreme and only question is who will rid us of the factory smoke only rid us of the factory smoke and you rid us of everything else and on top of it we win england's imperishable gratitude now i beseech you lay aside all private selfishness and mere considerations of bread and high wages and go to the polls vote the good old democratic ticket and clear this murky northern atmosphere of its all-pervading clouds of suffocating factory smoke then we will all knock off and have a good permanent holiday and a general good time vote your full strength for our three great and good democratic standard bearers english of connecticut english of indiana and the english on the other side of the water 
for this fight is an english fight pure and simple all the family are in it and there's nothing else to it i would vote that ticket myself but i have grown old in republican sin and it is too late to reform now i have spoken somewhat fantastically but no matter these fantastic trappings are hung around as solid and real a truth as any one can utter and it is a truth which not any of us can afford to whistle down the wind or scoff at or ignore or banish out of our minds unexamined and undigested for in plain simple terms it involves our actual bread and meat and no amount of fine talk and cooked-up statistics can take away from it that stern and ominous fact i will close these remarks with a fable once there was a community of happy and prosperous sparrows living in a pleasant wood near a lake in a wood on the other side of the lake lived a community of cuckoos you know no doubt the grasping and piratical habits of the cuckoo well these cuckoos were always crossing the lake and trying to get a chance to lay their eggs in the sparrows nests so that the industrious sparrows would have to go to the trouble and expense of hatching and rearing their young for them but there was a prohibitory protective tariff which the cuckoos could not manage to get around that is to say there was a family of eagles living near the sparrows and before a cuckoo could get in with her eggs she had to pay a high duty that is to say the eagles ate her up along with her eggs that sort of a tariff had the effect of persuading the cuckoos to stay at home but by and by certain of the sparrows grew discontented and began to complain they said this tariff is too exorbitant it hampers our prosperity what we need is a tariff for revenue only this wood is pleasant but if we had a wood tariff it would be pleasanter for then the cuckoos would come over and eggs would be ever so much cheaper and plentier than they are now eggs would be dirt cheap and we should all have just as many as we wanted this idea began to spread around and pretty soon more than half of the sparrows were enthusiastic over it so they went into power at the next election and the first thing they did was to go forth in their strength and disable the eagles that removed the protective tariff then they passed their wood tariff with great rejoicings straight away sure enough the cuckoos swarmed over from the other side of the lake flocked past the eagles dismantled custom house duty free and laid their eggs in the sparrows nests the prophecy had come true there was an abundance of eggs and an apparent prodigious prosperity but things did not remain so bright the sparrows found that they had to hatch out those eggs a heavy job but when it was done they had a still heavier one before them for they had to feed the little cuckoos too as well as their own little birds for the cuckoo never helps the cuckoo only furnishes the eggs that is all so the poor sparrows had to work double tides and yet all the real profit went to the cuckoo tribe for the little cuckoos were strong and voracious and they gobbled nine-tenths of every bite that came into the nest wherefore they waxed stronger day by day whilst the starving little sparrows waxed weaker and weaker and at last the natural result came about the powerful young cuckoos seeing that they were boss of the situation kicked the young sparrows out of the nests and took 
entire possession it was about this time that the community of sparrows rose up as one bird and remarked we are but mortal we are but sparrows and shall live to do many unwise things yet but the next time anybody beguiles us with a tariff for revenue only he will have to get up at a particularly early hour in the morning end of political speech read by john greenman this is section 34 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain funeral oration over the grave of the democratic party republican jollification opera house hartford november second eighteen eighty read by john greenman there are occasions which are so solemn so weighted with the deep concerns of life that then even the licensed jester must lay aside his cap and bells and remember that he is a man and mortal that even his light butterfly career of folly has its serious seasons and he cannot flee them or ignore them such a time my friends is this for we are in the near presence of one who is a passenger from this life one whom we have known long and well but shall know no more for ever about the couch of him who lies stricken are gathered those who hold him dear and who await the coming of a great sorrow his breathing is faint and grows fainter his voice is become a whisper his pulses scarcely record the languishing ebb and flow of the wasted current of life his lips are pallid and the froth of disillusion gathers upon them his face is drawn his cheeks are sunken the roses are gone from them and ashes are in their place his form is still his feet are ice his eyes are vacant beaded sweat is on his brow he picks at the coverlet with unconscious fingers he babbles a green fields death's rattle is in his throat his time is at hand with every breeze that comes to us out of the distances near and far from every segment of the wide horizon there comes a voice heavy with mourning and the burden of the morning is the aged and stricken democratic party is dying and the burden of the lament will be the mighty is fallen the democratic party is dead and who and what is he that is dying and will presently be dead a footsore political wanderer a hoary political tramp an itinerant poor actor familiar with many disguises a butcher of many parts in the north he played protection and hard money in the west he played protection free trade hard money and soft money changing disguises and parts according to the exigencies of the occasion in the south he played tariff for revenue in the north and west he played the apostle of freedom in the south he played the assassin of freedom and mouthed the sacred shibboleths of liberty with cruel and bloody lips his latest and final appearance upon the nation's stage was in the new piece entitled forgery a farce 
in which he was assisted by the whole strength of the company it was a poor piece it was indifferently played so it failed and he was hissed and abused by the audience but he lies low now and blame and praise are to him alike the charitable will spare the one the judicious will reserve the other o oh, friends this is not a time for jests and levity but a time for bended forms and uncovered heads for we stand in the near presence of majestic death a momentous and memorable death a grisly and awful death for it is a death from which there is no resurrection heaven bless us one and all heaven temper the blow to the afflicted family heaven grant them a change of heart and a better life end of funeral oration over the grave of the democratic party read by john greenman this is section thirty five of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain the benefit of judicious training twelfth annual reunion banquet army of the potomac allen house hartford june eighth eighteen eighty one read by john greenman let but the thoughtful civilian instruct the soldier in his duties and the victory is sure martin farquhar tupper on the art of war mr chairman i gladly join with my fellow townsmen in extending a hearty welcome to these illustrious generals and these war-scarred soldiers of the republic this is a proud day for us and if the sincere desire of our hearts has been fulfilled it has not been an unpleasant day for them i am in full accord sir with the sentiment of the toast for i have always maintained with enthusiasm that the only wise and true way is for the soldier to fight the battle and the unprejudiced civilian to tell him how to do it yet when i was invited to respond to this toast and furnish this advice and instruction i was almost as embarrassed as i was gratified for i could bring to this great service but the one virtue of absence of prejudice and set opinion still but one other qualification was needed and it was of only minor importance i mean knowledge of the subject therefore i was not disheartened for i could acquire that there being two weeks to spare a general of high rank in this army of the potomac said two weeks was really more than i would need for the purpose he had known people of my style who had learned enough in forty-eight hours to enable them to advise an army aside from the compliment this was gratifying because it confirmed an impression i had had before he told me to go to the united states military academy at west point and said in his flowery professional way that the cadets would load me up i went there and stayed two days and his prediction proved correct i make no boast on my own account none all i know about military matters i got from the gentlemen at west point and to them belongs the credit they treated me with courtesy from the first but when my mission was revealed this mere courtesy blossomed into the warmest zeal everybody officers and all put down their work and turned their whole attention to giving me military information every question i asked was 
promptly and exhaustively answered therefore i feel proud to state that in the advice which i am about to give you as soldiers i am backed by the highest military authority in the land yes in the world if an american does say it west point to begin gentlemen when an engagement is meditated it is best to feel the enemy first that is if it is night for as one of the cadets explained to me you do not need to feel him in the daytime because you can see him then i never should have thought of that but it is true perfectly true in the daytime the methods of procedure are various but the best it seems to me is one which was introduced by general grant general grant always sent an active young redoubt to reconnoiter and get the enemy's bearings i got this from a high officer at the point who told me that he used to be a redoubt on general grant's staff and had done it often when the hour for the battle is come move to the field with celerity fool away no time under this head i was told of a favorite maxim of general sheridan's general sheridan always said if the siege train isn't ready don't wait go by any train that's handy to get there is the main thing now that is the correct idea as you approach the field it is best to get out and walk this gives you a better chance to dispose your forces judiciously for the assault get your artillery in position and throw out stragglers to right and left to hold your lines of communication against surprise see that every hod carrier connected with a mortar battery is at his post they told me at the point that napoleon despised mortar batteries and never would use them he said for real efficiency he wouldn't give a hatful of brickbats for a ton of mortar however that is all he knew about it everything being ready for the assault you want to enter the field with your baggage to the front this idea was invented by our renowned guest general sherman they told me general sherman said the trunks and steamer chairs make a good protection for the soldiers but that chiefly they attract the attention and rivet the interest of the enemy and this gives you an opportunity to whirl the other end of the column around and attack him in the rear i have given a good deal of study to this tactic since i learned about it and it appears to me it is a rattling good idea never fetch on your reserves at the start this was napoleon's first mistake at waterloo next he assaulted with his bomb proofs and ambulances and embouchures when he ought to have used a heavier artillery thirdly he retired his right by ricochet which uncovered his pickets when his only possibility of success lay in doubling up his center flank by flank and throwing out his chevaux de frise by the left oblique to relieve the skirmish line and confuse the enemy if such a maneuver would confuse him and at west point they said it would it was about this time that the emperor had two horses shot under him how often you see the remark that general so-and-so in such-and-such a battle had two or three horses shot under him general burnside and many great european military men as i was informed by a high artillery officer at west point have justly characterized this as a wanton waste of projectiles and he impressed upon me a conversation held in the tent of the prussian chiefs at gravelotte in the course of which our honored guest just referred to general burnside observed that if you can't aim a horse so as to hit the general with it shoot it over him and you may bag somebody on the other side whereas a horse shot under a general does no sort of damage 
i agree cordially with general burnside and heaven knows i shall rejoice to see the artillerists of this land and of all lands cease from this wicked and idiotic custom at west point they told me of another mistake at waterloo namely that the french were under fire from the beginning of the fight to the end of it which was plainly a most effeminate and ill-timed attention to comfort and a fatal and foolish diversion of military strength for it probably took as many men to keep up the fires as it did to do the fighting it would have been much better to have a small fire in the rear and let the men go there by detachments and get warm and not try to warm up the whole army at once all the cadets said that an assault along the whole line was the one thing which would have restored napoleon's advantage at this juncture and he was actually rising in his stirrups to order it when a sutler burst at his side and covered him with dirt and debris and before he could recover his lost opportunity wellington opened a tremendous and devastating fire upon him from a monster battery of vivandieres and the star of the great captain's glory set to rise no more the cadet wept while he told me these mournful particulars when you leave a battlefield always leave it in good order remove the wreck and rubbish and tidy up the place however in the case of a drawn battle it is neither party's business to tidy up anything you can leave the field looking as if the city government of new york had bossed the fight when you are traversing the enemy's country in order to destroy his supplies and cripple his resources you want to take along plenty of camp followers the more the better they are a tremendously effective arm of the service and they inspire in the foe the liveliest dread a west point professor told me that the wisdom of this was recognized as far back as scripture times he quoted the verse he said it was from the new revision and was a little different from the way it reads in the old one i do not recollect the exact wording of it now but i remember that it wound up with something about such and such a devastating agent being as terrible as an army with bummers i believe i have nothing further to add but this the west pointers said a private should preserve a respectful attitude toward his superiors and should seldom or never proceed so far as to offer suggestions to his general in the field if the battle is not being conducted to suit him it is better for him to resign by the etiquette of war it is permitted to none below the rank of newspaper correspondent to dictate to the general in the field end of the benefit of judicious training read by john greenman this is section thirty six of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain de woman wid de golden arm reading selection first used about eighteen eighty one and often thereafter read by john greenman once upon a time away long ago there was a man and his wife that lived all alone in a house out in the middle of a big lonesome prairie there wasn't anybody or any house or any trees for miles and miles and miles around the woman had an arm that was gold just pure solid gold from the shoulder all the way down well by and by one night she died it was in the middle of winter and the wind was a blowin and the snow was a driftin and the sleet was a driving and it was awful dark but the man had to bury her 
so he took her and took a lantern and went away off across the prairie and dug a grave but when he was just going to put her in he thought he would steal her golden arm for he judged it couldn't ever be found out and he was a powerful mean man so then he cut it off and buried her and started back home then he stumbled along and plowed along and the snow and the sleet swashed in his face so he had to turn his head one side and could hardly get along at all and the wind it kept a crying and a wailing and a mourning way off across the prairie back there where the grave was just so Bzzz, imitating the rising and falling and complaining of the wintry night wind through his teeth it seemed to him like it was a ghost crying and worrying about some trouble or another and it made his hair stand up and he was all trembling and shivering the wind kept on going bzzz, and all of a sudden he caught his breath and stood still and leaned his ear to listen bzzz, goes the wind but right along in the midst of that sound he hears some words so faint so far away off he can hardly make them out where's my golden arm who's got my golden arm down drops the lantern and out it goes and there he is in that wide lonesome prairie in the pitch dark and the storm he started along again but he could hardly pull one foot after the other and all the way the wind was a crying and the snow a blowing and the voice a wailing where's my golden arm who's got my golden arm at last he got home and he locked the door and bolted it and chained it with a big log chain and put the chairs and things against it and then he crept upstairs and got into bed and covered up his head and ears and lay there a shivering and a listening the wind it kept a going and there was that voice again away ever so far away out in the prairie but it was a coming it was a coming every time it said the words it was closer than it was before by and by it was as close as the pasture next it was as close as the branch next it was this side the branch and right by the corn crib next it was to the smoke-house then it was right at the stile then right in the yard then it passed the ash-hopper and was right at the door right at the very door where's my golden arm the man shook and shook and shivered he don't hear the chain rattle he don't hear the bolt break he don't hear the door move still next minute he hears something coming pat 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 just as slow and just as soft up the stairs it's right at the door now where's my golden arm next it's right in the room who's got my golden arm then it's right up against the bed then it's a leaning down over the bed then it's down right against his ear and a whispering soft so soft and dreadful where's my golden arm who's got my golden arm 
then with a sudden fierce spring at the nearest auditor and a thunderous shout you got it end of the woman with the golden arm read by john greenman this is section 37 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech dinner for mark twain windsor hotel montreal december 8 1881 read by john greenman that a banquet should be given to me in this ostensibly foreign land and in this great city and that my ears should be greeted by such complimentary words from such distinguished lips are eminent surprises to me and i will not conceal the fact that they are also deeply gratifying i thank you one and all gentlemen for these marks of favor and friendliness and even if i have not really or sufficiently deserved them i assure you that i do not any the less keenly enjoy and esteem them on that account when a stranger appears abruptly in a country without any apparent business there and at an unusual season of the year the judicious thing for him to do is to explain this seems peculiarly necessary in my case on account of a series of unfortunate happenings here which followed my arrival and which i suppose the public have felt compelled to connect with that circumstance i would most gladly explain if i could but i have nothing for my defense but my bare word so i simply declare in all sincerity and with my hand on my heart that i never heard of that diamond robbery till i saw it in the morning paper and i can say with perfect truth that i never saw that box of dynamite till the police came to inquire of me if i had any more of it these are mere assertions i grant you but they come from the lips of one who was never known to utter an untruth except for practice and who certainly would not so stultify the traditions of an upright life as to utter one now in a strange land and in such a presence as this when there is nothing to be gained by it and he does not need any practice i brought with me to this city a friend a boston publisher but alas even this does not sufficiently explain these sinister mysteries if i had brought a toronto publisher along well, the case would have been different but no possibly not the burglar took the diamond studs but left the shirt only a reformed toronto publisher would have left the shirt to continue my explanation i did not come to canada to commit crime this time uh, but to prevent it i came here to place myself under the protection of the canadian law and secure a copyright i have complied with the requirements of the law i have followed the instructions of some of the best legal minds in the city including my own and so my errand is accomplished at least so far as any exertions of mine can aid that accomplishment this is rather a cumbersome way to fence and fortify one's property against the literary buccaneer it is true still if it is effective it is a great advance upon past conditions and one to be correspondingly welcomed it makes one hope and believe that a day will come when in the eye of the law literary property 
will be as sacred as whiskey or any other of the necessaries of life in this age of ours if you steal another man's label to advertise your own brand of whiskey with you will be heavily fined and otherwise punished for violating that trademark if you steal the whiskey without the trademark you go to jail but if you could prove that the whiskey was literature you can steal them both and the law wouldn't say a word it grieves me to think how far more profound and reverent a respect the law would have for literature if a body could only get drunk on it still the world moves the interests of literature upon our continent are improving let us be content and wait we have with us here a fellow craftsman born on our side of the atlantic who has created an epoch in this continent's literary history an author who has earned and worthily earned and received the vast distinction of being crowned by the academy of france this is honor and achievement enough for the cause and the craft for one decade assuredly if one may have the privilege of throwing in a personal impression or two i may remark that my stay in montreal and quebec has been exceedingly pleasant but the weather has been a good deal of a disappointment canada has a reputation for magnificent winter weather and has a prophet who is bound by every sentiment of honor and duty to furnish it but the result this time has been a mess of characterless weather which all right-feeling canadians are probably ashamed of still only the country is to blame nobody has a right to blame the prophet for this wasn't the kind of weather he promised well never mind what you lack in weather you make up in the means of grace this is the first time i was ever in a city where you couldn't throw a brick without breaking a church window yet i was told that you were going to build one more i said the scheme is good but where are you going to find room they said we will build it on top of another church and use an elevator this shows that the gift of lying is not yet dead in the land i suppose one must come in the summer to get the advantage of the canadian scenery a cabman drove me two miles up a perpendicular hill in a sleigh and showed me an admirable snowstorm from the heights of quebec the man was an ass i could have seen the snowstorm as well from the hotel window and saved my money still i may have been the ass myself there is no telling the thing is all mixed up in my mind but anyway there was an ass in the party and i do suppose that wherever a mercenary cabman and a gifted literary character are gathered together for business there is bound to be an ass in the combination somewhere it has always been so in my experience and i have usually been elected too but it is no matter i would rather be an ass than a cabman any time except in summer time then with my advantages i could be both i saw the plains of abraham and the spot where the lamented wolf stood when he made the memorable remark that he would rather be the author of gray's elegy than take quebec but why did he say so rash a thing it was because he supposed there was going to be international copyright otherwise 
there would be no money in it. I was also shown the spot where Sir William Phipps stood when he said he would rather take a walk than take two Quebecs, and he took the walk. I have looked with emotion here in your city upon the monument which makes forever memorable the spot where Horatio Nelson did not stand when he fell. I have seen a cab which Champlain employed when he arrived overland at Quebec. I have seen the horse which Jacques Cartier rode when he discovered Montreal. I have used them both. I will never do it again. Yes, I have seen all the historical places. The localities have been pointed out to me where the scenery is warehoused for the season. My sojourn has been to my moral and intellectual profit. I have behaved with propriety and discretion. I have meddled nowhere but in the election. But I am used to voting, for I live in a town where, if you may judge by local prints, there are only two conspicuous industries, committing burglaries and holding elections and I like to keep my hand in, so I voted a good deal here. Where so many of the guests are French, the propriety will be recognized of my making a portion of my speech in the beautiful language, in order that I may be partly understood. I speak French with timidity, and not flowingly, except when excited. When using that language, I have often noticed that I have hardly ever been mistaken for a Frenchman, except, perhaps, by horses. Never, I believe, by people. I had hoped that mere French construction with English words would answer, uh, but this is not the case. I tried it at a gentleman's house in Quebec, and it would not work. The maid-servant asked, What would monsieur? I said, Monsieur so-and-so, is he with himself? She did not understand that either. I said, He will desolate himself when he learns that his friend American was arrived, and he not with himself to shake him at the hand. She did not even understand that. I don't know why, but she didn't, and she lost her temper besides. Somebody in the rear called out, Qui est donc là? or words to that effect. She said, C'est un fou, and shut the door on me. Perhaps she was right, but how did she ever find that out? for she had never seen me before till that moment. But, as I have already intimated, I will close this oration with a few sentiments in the French language. I have not ornamented them, I have not burdened them with flowers or rhetoric, for, to my mind, that literature is best and most enduring, which is characterized by a noble simplicity. J'ai bel bouton d'or de mon oncle, mais je n'ai pas celui du charpentier. Si vous avez le fromage du brave menuisier, c'est bon, mais si vous ne l'avez pas, ne se désole pas, prenez le chapeau de drape noir de son beau-frère malade. Tout à l'heure, savoir-faire. Qu'est-ce que vous dites? Pâté de foie gras. Revenons à nos moutons. Pardon, monsieur, pardonnez-moi. Essayons à parler la belle langue. Dollendorf strains me more than you can possibly imagine. But I mean well and I've done the best I could. End of dinner speech, 
read by john greenman this is section thirty eight of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain at a dinner for monsieur frechette of quebec hotel windsor holyoke massachusetts january thirty first eighteen eighty two read by john greenman i have broken a vow in order that i might give myself the pleasure of meeting my friend freshette again but that is nothing to brag about a person who is rightly constructed will break a vow any time to meet a friend before i last met m freshette he had become the child of good fortune that is to say his poems had been crowned by the academy of france since i last met him he has become the child of good fortune once more that is to say i have translated his poems into english and written a eulogy of them in the french language to preface the work he possessed a single-barreled fame before he will possess a double-barreled fame now translations always reverse a thing and bring an entirely new side of it into view thus doubling the property and making two things out of what was only one thing before so in my translation his pathetic poems have naturally become humorous his humorous poems have become sad anybody who knows even the rudiments of arithmetic will know that m freshet's poems are now worth exactly twice as much as they were before i am glad to help welcome the laureate of quebec to our soil and i assure him that we will do our best to leave him no room to regret that he came yes as i was saying i broke a vow if it had been a trim shiny brand new one i should be sorry of course for it is always wrong and a pity to mistreat and injure good new property but this one was different i don't regret this one because it was an old ragged ramshackle vow that had seen so much service and been broken so often and patched and spliced together in so many places that it was become a disgraceful object and so rotten that i could never venture to put any strain worth mention upon it this vow was a vow which i first made eleven years ago on a new year's day that i would never make another after-dinner speech as long as i lived it was as good a vow then as i ever saw but i have broken it in sixty-four places since and mended it up fresh every new year's uh, seven years ago i reformed in another way i made a vow that i would lead an upright life meaning by that that i would never deliver another lecture i believe i have never broken that one i think i can be true to it always and thus disprove the reverend petroleum v nasby's maxim that burglars and lecturers never reform but this other vow has always been beyond my strength i mean i have always been beyond its strength the reason is simple it lies in the fact that the average man likes to hear himself talk when he is not under criticism the very man who sneers at your after-dinner speech when he reads it in next morning's paper would have been powerfully moved to make just as poor a one himself if he had been present with the encouraging champagne in him and the friendly uncritical faces all about him but that discourteous man doesn't do all the sneering that is done over your speech no he does only about a tenth of it you do the other nine tenths yourself 
your little talk which sounded so fine and warbly and nice when you were delivering it in the mellow light of the lamps and in an enchanted atmosphere of applause and all-pervading good fellowship looks miserably pale and vapid and lifeless in the cold print of a damp newspaper next morning with obituaries and cast-iron politics all around it and the hard gray light of day shining upon it and mocking at it you do not recognize the corpse you wonder if this is really that gay and handsome creature of the evening before you look him over and find he certainly is those very remains then you want to bury him you wish you could bury him privately end of at a dinner for monsieur freshet of quebec read by john greenman this is section thirty nine of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain advice to youth saturday morning club boston april fifteenth eighteen eighty two read by john greenman being told i would be expected to talk here i inquired what sort of a talk i ought to make they said it should be something suitable to youth something didactic instructive or something in the nature of good advice very well i have a few things in my mind which i have often longed to say for the instruction of the young for it is in one's tender early years that such things will best take root and be most enduring and most valuable first then i will say to you my young friends and say it beseechingly urgingly always obey your parents when they are present well, this is the best policy in the long run because if you don't they will make you most parents think they know better than you do and you can generally make more by humoring that superstition than you can by acting on your own better judgment be respectful to your superiors if you have any also to strangers and sometimes to others if a person offend you and you are in doubt as to whether it was intentional or not do not resort to extreme measures simply watch your chance and hit him with a brick that will be sufficient if you shall find that he had not intended any offence come out frankly and confess yourself in the wrong when you struck him acknowledge it like a man and say you didn't mean to yes always avoid violence in this age of charity and kindliness the time has gone by for such things leave dynamite to the low and unrefined go to bed early get up early this is wise some authorities say get up with one thing some with another but a lark is really the best thing to get up with it gives you a splendid reputation with everybody to know that you get up with the lark and if you get the right kind of a lark and work at him right you can easily train him to get up at half past nine every time it is no trick at all now as to the matter of lying you want to be very careful about lying otherwise you are nearly sure to get caught once caught you can never again be in the eyes of the good and the pure what you were before many a young person has injured himself permanently through a single clumsy and ill-finished lie uh, the result of carelessness born of incomplete training some authorities hold that the young ought not to lie at all that of course is putting it rather stronger than necessary still while i cannot go quite so far as that i do maintain and i believe i am right that the young ought to be temperate in the use of this great art until practice and experience shall give them that confidence 
elegance and precision which alone can make the accomplishment graceful and profitable patience diligence painstaking attention to detail these are the requirements these in time will make the student perfect upon these and upon these only may he rely as the sure foundation for future eminence think what tedious years of study thought practice experience went to the equipment of that peerless old master who was able to impose upon the whole world the lofty and sounding maxim that truth is mighty and will prevail the most majestic compound fracture of fact which any of woman born has yet achieved for the history of our race and each individual's experience are sown thick with evidences that a truth is not hard to kill and that a lie well told is immortal there in boston is a monument to the man who discovered anesthesia many people are aware in these latter days that that man didn't discover it at all but stole the discovery from another man is this truth mighty and will it prevail ah no my hearers uh, the monument is made of hardy material but the lie it tells will outlast it a million years an awkward feeble leaky lie is a thing which you ought to make it your unceasing study to avoid such a lie as that has no more real permanence than an average truth why you might as well tell the truth at once and be done with it a feeble stupid preposterous lie will not live two years except it be a slander upon somebody it is indestructible then of course but that is no merit of yours a final word begin your practice of this gracious and beautiful art early begin now if i had begun earlier i could have learned how never handle firearms carelessly the sorrow and suffering that have been caused through the innocent but heedless handling of firearms by the young only four days ago right in the next farmhouse to the one where i am spending the summer a mother old and gray and sweet one of the loveliest spirits in the land was sitting at her work when her young son crept in and got down an old battered rusty gun which had not been touched for many years and was supposed not to be loaded and pointed it at her laughing and threatening to shoot in her fright she ran screaming and pleading toward the door on the other side of the room but as she passed him he placed the gun almost against her very breast and pulled the trigger he had supposed it was not loaded and he was right it wasn't so there wasn't any harm done it is the only case of the kind i ever heard of therefore just the same don't you meddle with old unloaded firearms they are the most deadly and unerring things that have ever been created by man you don't have to take any pains at all with them you don't have to have a rest you don't have to have any sights on the gun you don't have to take aim even no you just pick out a relative and bang away and you are sure to get him a youth who can't hit a cathedral at thirty yards with a gatling gun in three quarters of an hour can take up an old empty musket and bag his mother every time at a hundred think what waterloo would have been if one of the armies had been boys armed with old rusty muskets supposed not to be loaded and the other army had been composed of their female relations the very thought of it makes me shudder there are many sorts of books but good ones are the sort for the young to read remember that they are a great an inestimable an unspeakable means of improvement therefore be careful in your selection my young friends be very careful confine yourself exclusively to robertson's sermons baxter's saint's rest 
the innocents abroad and works of that kind but i have said enough i hope you will treasure up the instructions which i have given you and make them a guide to your feet and a light to your understanding build your character thoughtfully and painstakingly upon these precepts and by and by when you have got it built you will be surprised and gratified to see how nicely and sharply it resembles everybody else's end of advice to youth read by john greenman This is section 40 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Woman, God bless her. 77th Annual Dinner, New England Society of New York, Delmonico's, December 22nd, 1882. Read by John Greenman. The toast includes the sex universally. It is to woman comprehensively wheresoever she may be found let us consider her ways first comes the matter of dress this is a most important consideration in a subject of this nature and must be disposed of before we can intelligently proceed to examine the profounder depths of the theme for text let us take the dress of two antipodal types the savage woman of central africa and the cultivated daughter of our high modern civilization among the fans a great negro tribe a woman when dressed for home or to go to market or go out calling does not wear anything at all but just her complexion that is all that is her entire outfit it is the lightest costume in the world but is made of the darkest material it has often been mistaken for mourning it is the trimmest and neatest and gracefulest costume that is now in fashion it wears well is fast colors doesn't show dirt you don't have to send it downtown to wash and have some of it come back scorched with the flat iron and some of it with the buttons ironed off and some of it petrified with starch and some of it chewed by the calf and some of it rotted with acids and some of it exchanged for other customers things that haven't any virtue but holiness and ten twelfths of the pieces overcharged for and the rest of the dozen mislaid and it always fits it is the perfection of a fit and it is the handiest dress in the whole realm of fashion it is always ready always done up when you call on a fan lady and send up your card the hired girl never says please take a seat madam is dressing she will be down in three-quarters of an hour no madam is always dressed always ready to receive and before you can get the doormat before your eyes she is in your midst then again the fan ladies don't go to church to see what each other has got on and they don't go back home and describe it and slander it such is the dark child of savagery as to everyday toilette and thus curiously enough she finds a point of contact with the fair daughter of civilization and high fashion who often has nothing to wear and thus these widely separated types of the sex meet upon common ground yes such is the fan woman as she appears in her simple unostentatious everyday toilette but on state occasions she is more dressy at a banquet she wears bracelets at a lecture she wears earrings and a belt 
at a ball she wears stockings and with the true feminine fondness for display she wears them on her arms at a funeral she wears a jacket of tar and ashes at a wedding the bride who can afford it puts on pantaloons thus the dark child of savagery and the fair daughter of civilization meet once more upon common ground and these two touches of nature make their whole world kin now we will consider the dress of our other type a large part of the daughter of civilization is her dress as it should be some civilized women would lose half their charm without dress and some would lose all of it the daughter of modern civilization dressed at her utmost best is a marvel of exquisite and beautiful art and expense all the lands all the climes and all the arts are laid under tribute to furnish her forth her linen is from belfast her robe is from paris her lace is from venice or spain or france her feathers are from the remote regions of southern africa her furs from the remoter home of the iceberg and the aurora her fan from japan her diamonds from brazil her bracelets from california her pearls from ceylon her cameos from rome she has gems and trinkets from buried pompeii and others that graced comely egyptian forms that have been dust and ashes now for forty centuries her watch is from geneva her card case is from china her hair is from from uh, i don't know where her hair is from uh, i never could find out that is her other hair her public hair her sunday hair i don't mean the hair she goes to bed with why you ought to know the hair i mean it's that thing which she calls a switch and which resembles a switch as much as it resembles a brickbat or a shotgun or any other thing which you correct people with it's that thing which she twists and then coils round and round her head beehive fashion and then tucks the end in under the hive and harpoons it with hairpins and that reminds me of a trifle any time you want to you can glance around the carpet of a pullman car and go and pick up a hairpin uh, but not to save your life can you get any woman in that car to acknowledge that hairpin now isn't that strange but it's true the woman who has never swerved from cast-iron veracity and fidelity in her whole life will when confronted with this crucial test deny her hairpin she will deny that hairpin before a hundred witnesses i have stupidly got into more trouble and more hot water trying to hunt up the owner of a hairpin in a pullman car than by any other indiscretion of my life well you see what the daughter of civilization is when she is dressed and you have seen what the daughter of savagery is when she isn't such is woman as to costume i come now to consider her in her higher and nobler aspects as mother wife widow grass widow mother-in-law hired girl telephone operator telephone helloer queen book agent wet nurse stepmother boss professional fat woman professional double-headed woman professional beauty and so forth and so on we will simply discuss these few let the rest of the sex 
tarry in jericho till we come again first in the list of right and first in our gratitude comes a woman who why dear me i've been talking three-quarters of an hour i beg a thousand pardons but you see yourselves that i had a large contract i have accomplished something anyway i have introduced my subject and if i had till next forefathers day i am satisfied that i could discuss it as adequately and appreciatively as so gracious and noble a theme deserves but as the matter stands now let us finish as we began and say without jesting but with all sincerity woman god bless her End of Woman, God Bless Her, read by John Greenman. This is section 41 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introducing George W. Cable. Unity Hall, Hartford, April 4, 1883. Read by John Greenman a complete stranger myself to mr cable personally though a great admirer of his books i appear before you as his sponsor to-night if he needs one the original idea was that mr william dean howells of new york was to introduce mr cable of new orleans to the hartford audience when it occurred to the committee that mr howells was himself a stranger to hartford and did not know hartford nor did hartford know him so mr thomas bailey aldridge of boston was brought from boston to introduce mr howells of new york who was to introduce mr cable of new orleans but some one was necessary to introduce mr aldridge of boston so mr gilder of new york was asked to introduce mr aldridge of boston who was to introduce mr howells of new york who was to introduce mr cable of new orleans then the same ob objection arose no one knew mr gilder of new york so mr john boyle o'reilly of boston was asked to introduce mr gilder of new york who was to introduce mr aldridge of boston who was to introduce mr howells of new york who was to introduce mr cable of new orleans once more an awful problem arose in the minds of the committee mr john b o'reilly of boston had never been in hartford before and only knew it as a place of five minutes for refreshments on the new haven railroad the question once more arose who would introduce mr o'reilly of boston and for a time no proper person appeared on the horizon after some deliberation for the matter was getting serious we decided to dispense with an introduction altogether which would occupy another evening at least and to let cable speak for himself i have however here present on the platform all these distinguished gentlemen from our suburban cities which will account for the menagerie behind me and this ladies and gentlemen of hartford is mr cable of new orleans introducing george w cable read by john greenman this is section forty two of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain on adam royal literary and scientific society dinner ottawa may twenty third eighteen eighty three read by john greenman i never feel wholly at home and equal to the occasion except when i am to respond for the royal family or the president of the united states but i am full of serenity courage and 
confidence then because i know by experience that i can drink standing and in silence just as long as anybody wants me to sometimes i have gone on responding to those toasts with mute and diligent enthusiasm until i have become an embarrassment and people have requested me to sit down and rest myself but responding by speech is a sore trial to me the list of toasts being always the same one is always so apt to forget and say something that has already been said at some other banquet some time or other for instance you take the toast to well take any toast in the regulation lot and you won't get far in your speech before you notice that everything you are saying is old not only old but stale and not only stale but rancid at any rate that is my experience there are gifted men who have the faculty of saying an old thing in a new and happy way they rub the old aladdin lamp and bring forth the smoke and thunder the giants and genie the pomp and pageantry of all the wide and secret realms of enchantment and these men are the saviors of the banquet but for them it must have gone silent as carlyle would say generations ago and ceased from among the world's occasions and industries but i cannot borrow their trick i do not know the mystery of how to rub the old lamp the right way and so it has seemed to me that for the behoof of my sort and kind the toast list ought to be reconstructed we ought to have some of the old themes knocked out of it and a new one or two inserted in their places there are plenty of new subjects if we would only look around and plenty of old ones too that have not been touched there is adam for instance whoever talks about adam at a banquet well, all sorts of recent and ephemeral celebrities are held up and glorified on such occasions but who ever says a good word for adam yet why is he neglected why is he ignored in this offensive way can you tell me that what has he done that we let banquet after banquet go on and never give him a lift considering what we and the whole world owe him he ought to be in the list yes and he ought to be way up high in the list too he ought to take precedence of the press yes and the army and navy and literature and the day we celebrate and pretty much everything else in the united states he ought to be at the very top he ought to take precedence of the president and even in the loyalist monarchy he ought at least to come right after the royal family and be drunk in silence and standing too it is his right and for one i propose to stick here and drink him in silence and standing till i can't tell a ministering angel from a tax collector this neglect has been going on too long you always place woman at the bottom of the toast list it is but simple justice to place adam at the top of it for if it had not been for the help of these two where would you and your banquets be answer me that you must excuse me for losing my temper and carrying on in this way and in truth i would not do it if it were almost 
anybody but adam but i am of a narrow and clannish disposition and i never can see a relative of mine misused without going into a passion it is no trick for people with plenty of celebrated kin to keep cool when their folk are misused but adam is the only solitary celebrity in our family and the man that misuses him has got to walk over my dead body or go around that is all there is to it that is the way i feel about adam years ago when i went around trying to collect subscriptions to build a monument to him there wasn't a man that would give a cent and generally they lost their temper because i interrupted their business and they drove me away and said they didn't care a damn for adam and in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred they got the emphasis on the wrong end of the word such is the influence of passion on a man's pronunciation i tried congress congress wouldn't build the monument they wouldn't sell me the washington monument they wouldn't lend it to me temporarily while i could look around for another i am negotiating for that bastille yonder by the public square in montreal but they say they want to finish it first of course that ends the project because there couldn't be any use of a monument after the man was forgotten it is a pity because i thought adam might have pleasant associations with that building he must have seen it in his time but he shall have a monument yet even it be only a grateful place in the list of toasts for to him we owe the two things which are most precious life and death life which the young the hopeful the undefeated hold above all wealth and all honors and death the refuge the solace the best and kindliest and most prized friend and benefactor of the erring the forsaken the old and weary and broken of heart whose burdens be heavy upon them and who would lie down and be at rest i would like to see the toast list reconstructed for it seems to me a needed reform and as a beginning in this direction if i can meet with a second i beg to nominate adam i am not actuated by family considerations it is a thing which i would do for any other member of our family or anybody else's if i could honestly feel that he deserved it but i do not if i seem to be always trying to shove adam into prominence i can say sincerely that it is solely because of my admiration of him as a man who was a good citizen at a time when it was difficult to be a good citizen a good husband at a time when he was not married a good father at a time when he had to guess his way having never been young himself and would have been a good son if he had had the chance he could have been governor if he had wanted to he could have been postmaster general speaker of the house he could have been anything he chose if he had been willing to put himself up and stand a canvas yet he lived and died a private citizen without a handle to his name and he comes down to us as plain simple adam and nothing more a man who could have elected himself major general adam or anything else as easy as rolling off a log i stand up for him on account of his sterling private virtues as a man and a citizen as an inventor 
inventor of life and death and sin and the fashions and not because he simply happens to be kin to me end of on adam read by john greenman this is section 43 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech banquet of wheelmen springfield massachusetts september 16th or 17th 1884 read by john greenman mr chairman i am not sure that i have voice enough to make myself heard over such a far-stretching landscape of humanity as this but i will do what i can i have been asked to tell briefly what bicycling is like from the novice's point of view i judge that this is for the instruction of the eight hundred guests scattered through this vast assemblage who are not wheelmen for it is not likely that i could tell the rest of you anything about bicycling which you do not already know as twelve speakers are to follow me and as the weather is very warm and close besides i shall be careful to make quite sure of one thing at least i will keep well within the ten-minute limit allowed each speaker it was on the tenth day of may of the present year that a brace of curiously contrasted events added themselves to the sum of my experiences for on that day i confessed to age by mounting spectacles for the first time and in the same hour i renewed my youth to outward appearance by mounting a bicycle for the first time the spectacles stayed on end of dinner speech read by john greenman This is section 44 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Turncoats, Political Meeting, Hartford, Late October, 1884. Read by John Greenman. It seems to me that there are things about this campaign which almost amount to inconsistencies. This language may sound violent. If it does, it is traitor to my mood the mugwumps are contemptuously called turncoats by the republican speakers and journals the charge is true we have turned our coats we have no denials to make as to that but does a man become of a necessity base because he turns his coat and are there no republican turncoats except the mugwumps please look at the facts in the case candidly and fairly before sending us to political perdition without company why are we called turncoats because we have changed our opinion changed it about what about the greatness and righteousness of the principles of the republican party no that is not changed we believe in those principles yet no one doubts this what then is it that we have changed our opinions about why about mr blaine that is the whole change there is no other decidedly we have done that and do by no means wish to deny it but when did we change it yesterday last week last summer no we changed it years and years ago as far back as eighteen seventy six 
the vast bulk of the republican party changed its opinion of him at the same time and in the same way will anybody be hardy enough to deny this was there more than a handful of really respectable and respectworthy republicans on the north atlantic seaboard who did not change their opinion of mr blaine at that time was not the republican atmosphere both private and journalistic so charged with this fact that none could fail to perceive it very well was this multitude called turncoats at that time of course not that would have been an absurdity was any of this multitude held in contempt at that time and derided and execrated for turning his blaine coat no one thought of such a thing now then we who are called the mugwumps turned our coats at that time and they have remained so turned to this day if it is shameful to turn one's coat once what measure of scorn can adequately describe the man who turns it twice if to turn one's coat once makes one a dude a pharisee a mugwump and fool where shall you find language rancid enough to describe a double turncoat if to turn your coat at a time when no one can impeach either the sincerity of the act or the cleanliness of your motives in doing it is held to be a pathetic spectacle what sort of spectacle is it when such a coat turner turns his coat again and this time under quite suggestively different circumstances that is to say after a nomination do these double turncoats exist and who are they they are the bulk of the republican party and it is hardly venturing too far to say that neither you nor i can put his finger upon a respectable member of that great multitude who can put a denial of it instantly into words and without blush or stammer here in hartford they do not deny they confess that they are double turncoats they say they are convinced that when they formerly changed their opinion about mr blaine they were wrong and so they have changed back again which would seem to be an admission that to change one's opinion and turn one's coat is not necessarily a base thing to do after all yet they call my tribe the customary hard names in their next campaign speeches just the same without seeming to see any inconsistency or impropriety in it well it is all a muddle to me i cannot make out how it is or why it is that a single turncoat is a reptile and a double turncoat a bird of paradise i easily perceive that the republican party has deserted us and deserted itself but i am not able to see that we have deserted anything or anybody as for me i have not deserted the republican code of principles for i propose to vote its ticket with the presidential exception and i have not deserted mr blaine for as regards him i got my free papers before he bought the property personally i know that two of the best known of the hartford campaigners for blaine did six months ago hold as uncomplimentary opinions about him as i did then and as i do to-day i am told upon what i conceive to be good authority that the two or three other connecticut campaigners of prominence of that ilk held opinions concerning him of that same uncomplimentary breed up to the day of the nomination these gentlemen 
have turned their coats and they now admire blaine and not calmly temperately but with a sort of ferocious rapture in a speech the other night one of them spoke of the author of the mulligan letters those strange vassar-like exhibitions of eagerness gushingness timidity secretiveness frankness naivete unsagacity and almost incredible and impossible indiscretion as the first statement of the age another of them spoke of the three great statesmen of the age gladstone bismarck and blaine doubtless this profound remark was received with applause but suppose the gentleman had had the daring to read some of those letters first appending the names of bismarck and gladstone to them do not you candidly believe that the applause would have been missing and that in its place there would have been a smile which you could have heard to springfield for no one has ever seen a republican mass meeting that was devoid of the perception of the ludicrous end of turncoats read by john greenman